my goodness, friends. Ah, oh, man, the worship has been so sweet this morning. But let's just talk about that bumper video we just watched with the little emojis dancing. Um, okay, I don't know who uh, had the idea who said we need to have like 10,000 different faces in order to make our communication system better. But I have to tell you, I actually think that person was brilliant. Um, I don't know, have you ever just gotten like a quick text, a quick email, and you read the, the words and you think, I don't know, could go either way, I'm not really sure the tone, I don't know what they mean. For example, what if I texted this to you? I just love it when he says that. I don't know, it could go either way, right? You don't know what I mean, but what if I added this little emoji? <gasps> you go, oh, that's probably from her husband, right? I just love it when he does that. Oh, that's so sweet. But what if I changed it and added that? The eyes rolling, then you know, I actually mean a completely different thing. I, here's the deal. When you read something, it seems, it could seem like it means one thing, but you add context to it, you add a little bit more information, and what you may find is that it has a completely different meaning. We've been in the series called The Happiness Habit. We are looking at how to be happy. Why? Because we all want happiness. We, want, we long to be happy. We want our friends to be happy. We want our children to be happy. Like, I don't know anyone who wakes up in the morning that says, I cannot wait to be miserable today. Like, we don't do that. We want to be happy. So what's the secret? Well, if you've been listening over the last few weeks, you may think, gosh, what I thought this was going to be sounds a little bit different. The first week we talked about finding happiness in adversity. And then last week we talked about having happiness or joy in unity. So I thought, well, maybe what we need to do is we need to look in the Bible and to find happy people. And we can see what their lives look like and then maybe that's what we need to do. So who would be happy? Well, if you look at the Pharisees, you would think, okay, the Pharisees should be happy people. They're incredibly intelligent. They have tons of knowledge within them. So if they have all of the education, all of the academics, surely then they would know how to be happy. But if you look at the Pharisees, what you find is actually they're just rigid. They are people that, are, like, let's just be honest, they're a bit grumpy when you read about the Pharisees. Okay, well, what about money? Surely people with money should be happy. Well, you look at the rich young ruler. First of all, young. Um, feeling pretty good that if you're young, you're probably feeling happier, you're rich, Money must make you happy. He must have been one of the happiest people in Scripture. But when he goes to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? Jesus said, I got it for you. Look, this is so easy. All you have to do is just put aside the money. Just give it away. Don't let it worry you. Do that, and then you can follow me, and you can have eternal life. You can have the thing that you long for the most. Did he do it? Could he do it? No. All of his wealth didn't give him happiness. It actually created this shackle of control within his life. So he couldn't give up that thing to be happy. So who then was happy? Well, how about the widow? How about the widow who gave her last two coins, took them and put them in the offering, and Jesus said, hey guys, you see her? This is what you should be like. This woman who gave everything that she had, this is the woman that found happiness, contentment. What about Paul? Paul, who was shipwrecked, beaten. I mean, terrible things happened to him. He's in prison, and yet it's Paul who's writing a letter about joy. It's so counterintuitive to our thinking. In the world, 
When you want something so badly, it, it's pretty much a straight line to get it. You, you set a goal, you start doing the work, you do whatever you have to do, you go on and on, you, you hit the milestones, eventually you're gonna find yourself at the goal. You're going to reach there. But happiness isn't about a straight line. Actually, happiness is about a circle. The secret to happiness is a circle of selfless, service, and sacrifice. It's counterintuitive, but it's truth. And we're going to read more about that in our passage in Philippians. So if you have your Bibles, got your app, whatever, I want you to turn. We're going to go back to the same chapter we were in last week, Philippians 2. And we're actually going to begin where Mark talked about last week in Philippians 3. He said this verse, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. What he talked about, he, he said, to find joy, you have to have humility or you have to have unity. And that means having the same mind as Christ. That means having humility like Christ, being willing to take up the towel, to serve one another. And I love that he said that the antidote to pride is in the phrase one another to be willing to put Christ first and others second. That, for Paul, was how he lived his life. That was the mindset that he had. He knew that for happiness, that meant giving himself away. So I want to continue to read in um, Philippians 2. I want to go to verse 16, where it says, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Paul's life was all about sharing Christ. He was going to do whatever it took, whatever it cost to tell people about the Lord Jesus. And in fact, if you look back at the very beginning when he says, this is how he's gonna be happy. He's gonna be happy if he can boast, if he can talk about, and at the end of his life, he can show that he has labored in vain, that he has labored in vain. Labor, this Greek word, um, kopiaho, it means to toil to the point of exhaustion. Paul labored. He toiled to the point of exhaustion. That seems so counterintuitive to how we think. But the more he gave away, the more he was able to love people, the more he wanted to give away, he wanted to labor, he wanted to toil, to give his entire life away. And in that passage, he created this beautiful image of this um, wine that was poured out, poured out like a drink offering. It reminds me of a song that I love. Hillsong put it out a few years ago called New Wine. And in part of the lyrics of that song, it says, make me a vessel. Make me an offering. Let me be an offering that is poured out in context. When at, Back in Paul's day, when you would create a sacrifice, the final step would be to take wine and to pour it over that which has been sacrificed, which made the sacrifice complete. Paul says, I want my life. I want to toil to the point of exhaustion. I want my life to be poured out as an offering. In fact, in Greek, that phrase, um, I am being poured out as a drink offering, means devote one's life. Paul found happiness pouring out his life. He found the secret to happiness being selfless. Now, you may think, that's awesome for Paul. Good for him. He found happiness being a missionary not happening for me. That doesn't work for me. So Susan, what is my secret to happiness? Well, Michael Norton um, has a TED Talk called How to Buy Happiness. Uh, great title. I am quite sure. In fact, I looked. There are like over 2 million people who have watched this. Clearly, we are all trying to look for happiness. So um, 
Michael Norton was part of this team that went out and said, okay, we're going to run this experiment to figure out how, do we, how can people find happiness? How can they buy happiness? And they went to a college campus, and they grabbed people. They said, do you want to be part of a, a study? Yes, I want to be part of a study. Great, come over here. Um, how happy are you? You know, what was the last thing you spent money on? They got some background information, and then they gave them an envelope. Now, half of the envelopes had money and a letter that said, by 5 p.m. today, I want you to spend this money on yourself. You can buy anything you want. You can do whatever you want to with it, but you have to spend it on yourself. The other half of the people got an envelope with money in it and a letter that said, by 5 p.m. today, I want you to go spend this money on someone else. You can do whatever you want to with it, but it has to be on someone else. And at the end of the day, they gathered everyone together. They made sure, did you spend the money the way that the letter told you? Yes, I did. And then they found out how happy they were. And what's interesting is the people who had free money, who could spend it on themselves, they were no more or less happy than they were at the beginning of the day. But consistently, the people who spent money, who gave the money away to someone else were happier. Now you may think, gosh, that's a college campus. Those people, they're, man, they get happy about just about anything, right? So what does that mean? Well, they took that study and they actually went across the world. They went to Uganda and they replicated it. They went into companies, they found teams and they said, okay, Half of you have money, spend it on yourself, and then half of you have money, spend it on your teammates. And no matter where they were, no matter who the subject matters were, the results were exactly the same. What they found out is the more we give away, the more happiness we experience. And what I find hilarious, total God moment, I'm scrolling through my Facebook this week, and on Thursday, a friend of mine made a post. She has no idea I'm preaching. She has no idea, by the way, that I've stolen this from her Facebook page, but you put it on social media, I'll grab it. And this is what she posted. Not a very good week. So I drove through Taco Bell, and I got 20 bucks of tacos and went to pass them out to the homeless in Conroe. It changed my day. Now, how in the world did that change your day, Stacy? You now are um, $20, you know, you have $20 less money in your bank account. You didn't say that you got any of those tacos for yourself. You went out of your way to go somewhere where maybe you weren't planning to be anyway to give away something that you didn't have to give away to people that weren't necessarily going to thank you for it. So how did it change your day? It's because she knew what Paul knew, and she knew that the way to change her day, to turn it around, to get happier, was to give herself away. So in our circle, you have selflessness, looking at others before yourself, and you have this idea of service, to give um, for other people. And as Paul continues to write, in his letter to the Philippians, he introduces someone to us. And, and what I love is that, um, and Mark read about Epaphroditus, and I am going to guess that most of us, until you heard it today, maybe this is not someone that you've ever heard of before. You may have never studied Epaphroditus because this is the only place in scripture where he is even mentioned. He has one teeny tiny little mention a little bit later in this letter, but nowhere else in the Bible do we hear about Epaphroditus? But Paul talks about this Philippian, and I want to read in verse 25. But I, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow co-worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. So who is Epaphroditus? So he is a Philippian. He left Philippi to go serve alongside Paul, to serve Paul and his needs, but also to serve alongside Paul, to have the same mindset as Paul, to go and give Christ to others. And what I love is that as we read and as Mark showed us, he became ill at some point in time. Scholars don't really know where or when. Um, it could have been as he was traveling to 
Paul, that he became very ill and then he recovered. Or perhaps he got to Paul, was serving alongside, and then became ill. We're not sure exactly, but what we do know is that he was able to recover and to continue to work. And then I love the way that Paul describes the relationship that he has with Epaphroditus. He says, you're my brother. You're my co-worker, or might say co-laborer. You're my fellow soldier. And I don't know about you. This is what I have experienced. There is nothing better than serving alongside friends. I mean, there is nothing better to be on a mission trip where it is hot, you are dirty, you don't have control over what food you eat, you may be sleeping on an air mattress, you may be sleeping somewhere else, and it is so counterintuitive that those types of conditions would actually make you happier, but they do. There is something that when we grab a friend and we say, let's go serve together, God does something to bond us together, and that relationship grows. Now, Paul and Epaphrodite, we have no idea how long they served together, but what we know is because they served together, God built up that relationship to be a brother, a co-laborer, a fellow soldier. And what we do know is that we need to serve alongside one another, whatever that means for you. Look at 1 um, Peter 4, 10. It tells us how we can serve. It tells us that we should. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. The secret to happiness is to serve. The secret to happiness is to serve alongside one another. And what God does is he magnifies the joy that we experience. So Paul and Epaphroditus, they have have served together They have uh, labored together, but now we really learn that Paul is going to send Epaphroditus back home. Philippians 2, starting in verse 28, we find out a little bit more information. Therefore I, this is Paul speaking, therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad And I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy. Honor people like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. What I love is that Paul, who is in prison, let's be very clear, he's in prison. And when you're in prison, you have to rely on people to bring you food. You have to rely on people to serve you. And yet, Paul, in his greatest need of needing people to take care of him, he says, you know what? No, my greatest joy is going to be to send him back to you because I know that Epaphroditus probably had to give up his family, had to give up his friends, maybe had to give up his future plans for his life when he came to serve me, and yet as much as he gave, as much as I need him, I'm going to be happier if I can give up what I need and to give him back to you so that you can be happy. And if you're happy, that's going to make me happy. And I love that Paul says, then honor people like him. Look around. We should be looking around us, looking at who is serving, who is laboring, who is toiling to the point of exhaustion for the sake of Christ so that people would know the love and grace of God. Honor those people. We are surrounded by those people. And then what we realize is happiness is not actually a circle. Happiness is actually much more like an infinity sign. Because the more we're selfless, the more selfless, the more joy we get, which makes us want to serve others, which gives us more joy, which leads me to want to sacrifice, to give more, to pour out my life as an offering, which gives me more joy. And it goes on and on and gone. The secret of happiness 
is to have the same mind and to follow what Jesus tells us. Look in Matthew 16. Jesus tells us to do the same. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will find it. It's counterintuitive. But that is how we find happiness. So I want to do what Paul said. I want to honor people like Epaphroditus. I want to honor those who toil to the point of exhaustion, who devote their life. And there's somebody, I haven't even met her in person, but when I heard her story, I thought, man, she is like Epaphroditus. Her name is Tabitha Kentner. She's a nurse at Methodist Hospital, and she um, applied to be on the front lines when they began to create the COVID unit, the new COVID unit. And her first day on, she was assigned a patient. His name is Richard Stubinger. He quickly got the name Grandpa. Grandpa entered the hospital actually for another reason altogether. And as he recovered, they got ready to discharge him, had told his family he's going to be discharged today. But part of protocol was that he would be tested for COVID, even though he showed no signs or symptoms. And when they tested him for COVID, everyone was shocked because Grandpa tested positive. That meant Not only did they have to move him quickly to this new unit, they needed to call his daughter, Sean Cresswell, to tell her, you're you're not gonna come pick up your father today. We we actually need to move him to another unit. And um, Grandpa didn't have a cell phone, didn't have any way to see or to communicate with his daughter. But what we know is that God placed Tabitha right there at that place to care for her father. And I want you to watch this video where you're going to see a little bit more about Tabitha. Now, that's not where the story ends. Even as his health quickly declined, nurses Tabitha and Janice dedicated their lives. They devoted their lives to serve grandpa, asking Sean, what kind of music does he like? Is he a man of faith? Can we read scriptures to him? And of course, I said he didn't have a cell phone. There was no way to communicate with his family. And so Tabitha used her own personal cell phone so that they could video chat. And when they realized that grandpa couldn't hear because his hearing aids had been taken off, Tabitha brought in speakers. She did whatever it, it took to make sure that he could connect to his family. His family could connect to him. And as his final moments on earth came, Janice sang amazing grace over him. As these nurses devoted themselves to grandpa, it, it wasn't sadness that filled the room. It was comfort. It was peace. And yes, it was even happiness. And because of the way that they lived their lives, because of the way they devoted their lives, that they toiled to the point of exhaustion, it inspired so many. You see, Sean Cresswell is not just um, the daughter of this man. She is part of our family. She's a harvester here. She's also the principal of Colson Tuff Elementary. And Sean's family, her school, they have been inspired by the life of these nurses, these doctors, and they wanted to give back. So they have created these care packages to give to these nurses. They said, what do you need the most? The nurses said, you know, when we wear all this um, equipment, our our faces get really dry, our lips get dry, we we need help. There are are nurses and doctors who don't even go home to their family because they don't want to um, possibly take this virus home. And so they live in hotels. 
Um, we need a little. So Sean put out the word. Her school just responded and said, yes, let's help. Let me help. They created a foundation so that money could be um, raised to buy iPads for patients who are in isolation so that they can connect with their family so they don't have to just use the cell phones of a nurse. They are raising money so that nurses can uh, get specialized training if they desire. And they did simple things like write notes. I love these notes that came and I love that Sean shared them with me. There's one I want to read. It's from Ander, who is a fifth grader at Colson Tuff. He says, dear nurses and doctors, my name is Ander. I'm from Colson Tuff Elementary, and I want to thank you for all your hard work in this crisis time. And then he writes, I want to say special thank you to Nurse Tabitha Kentner that she took care of the 93-year-old grandpa. He was the father of my principal at school. And it really touched my heart to see all the love she gave him, how she got involved with his personal life, asking the names of his family, being with him all the time she can, even in her rest time. Doctors, thank you for all you do. That makes us to have hope and believe in you. Now, how on earth could the death of a person create such a movement of serving others and sacrifice? It's because 2,000 years ago, Jesus did it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus showed us how to serve, how to grab the towel and to serve one another, how to have humility. Jesus showed us how to serve one another. Jesus showed us how to sacrifice our life for one another. So this week, if we want to find a little more happiness, maybe what we need to do is look at our life and see what part of it could we give away. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, thank you for sacrifice. Thank you for showing us how to give our own life away so that people could understand and experience your love to learn how to devote our life for one another. Father, I pray that you would search our hearts, that you would show us what we could give away for the sake of another this week. And Father, I thank you, and I want to honor those who are devoting their lives right now, today, for the sake of others, for your glory, Father. It's in your name we pray.